So that's one of the ideas of parametrism and parametric urbanism, that with that new style, and that's my thesis, you should be able to build up new regional and past-dependent cumulative urban identities, which are nature-like in a sense, uh, like a multi-species ecology. So this is all premised on a much more market-driven process, and I'm talking about market-based urban order, and I believe that we can develop a sense of urban order without relying on a central plan, on a blueprint, on a design city. It can be evolving bottom-up through entrepreneurial interventions, calling on architects to develop a multi-species ecology like the jungle or, or natural environments. There's nobody who has designed those. They come out, out of bottom-up processes of overlaying different species, different systems, different interventions, but with the sensibility of and the necessity of interarticulating and fitting in. So central planning, no forms of emergent collective action processes, yes. Hi, Michael. Hi, I'm Patrick Schumacher. Welcome to An Architecture, Episode 11. This is the third episode in our series about Patrick Schumacher, director of Zaha Hadid Architects. And this is the big one, my interview with Patrick at the Zaha Hadid Design Gallery in London. In case you missed it, in Episode 9, we introduced Patrick and his ideas and described how we connected with him through a blog post I wrote defending him in the wake of a controversial speech he gave at the World Architecture Festival in November 2016 in which he promoted libertarian and even anarcho-capitalist solutions to London's housing crisis. Then, in episode 10, we reviewed and criticized the media responses to Patrick's presentation. So now that we've said our piece about the housing controversy, we didn't want to rehash it in this interview, although we touched on it in a few places. Instead, I wanted to focus the interview on what I perceive to be Patrick's true passion, his work on architectural theory. In 2009, Patrick published a 480-page book called The Autopoiesis of Architecture, a comprehensive analysis of historical and contemporary architectural theory as a self-generating discipline. The word autopoiesis refers to biological self-production. He asserts architecture's societal function as creating a spatial order to frame communicative interaction. This was his magnum opus and a significant achievement in the field of architectural theory. But that wasn't enough. Patrick still had more to say about it. A lot more. So in 2011, he published Volume 2 of The Autopoiesis of Architecture, a 784-page manifesto analyzing contemporary society and the complex tasks it presents to the discipline of architecture. He concludes by arguing for a new style of architecture called parametricism, which he believes to be the most advantageous architectural response to the complexity of contemporary society. I'm ashamed to say that I haven't finished reading his books yet. I'm still on the table of contents. Although I probably learned more about architectural theory from reading his table of contents than I did in five years of architecture school. Nothing against a school, I just uh, had a bad habit of nodding off in the middle of lecture classes. A lot of late nights in studio. Patrick also lectures frequently on these topics. So you'll hear him rattle off phrases like contemporary post-fortist network society and complex variegated market-based urban order that are deeply meaningful but may go over your head on the first listen. So Joe and I have added some commentary in the next episode, episode 12, to highlight and clarify some of his key points. Patrick and I start off talking about architectural theory, then discuss his political theory and how he transitioned from an earlier interest in Marxism to libertarianism. Then we take a step back and talk about the challenge of promoting radical ideas, whether it's avant-garde architectural theory or radical political theory. This is one of the reasons I wanted to focus on his architectural theory work, because I saw a strong parallel between that effort and our shared goal of promoting libertarian theory. Finally, we'll discuss the opportunities that the theory and style of parametricism presents for creating order in urban environments that fosters and responds to market-based entrepreneurial development. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. 
I wanted to focus this discussion on your work on architectural theory. Our audience is, at this point, it's mostly libertarians who may be familiar with the built environment and some architectural principles, but might not be very familiar with architectural theory in general, and specifically with your theories of, of parametricism, which we'll get into in a bit here. Yeah. So I thought we could start just with having you describe um, some basics of what is architectural theory, why is it important? Architectural theory is an essential ingredient of the discipline of architecture, which, in my view, started in the Renaissance with Alberti, because that's the first time we witness an architect author with a name and taking responsibility for a new design, uh, with a consciousness of being an innovator and proposing something new. Prior to this, buildings were done by construction crews, by master builders, uh, which remained mostly anonymous and were mostly doing things the way they've always been done. Uh, I call this tradition-bound building and distinguish this from architecture. So architecture comes along the Renaissance together with theory right from the start because the the architectural theory is required to explain and motivate why a new and different looking building and differently designed building is being proposed. You don't rely on taking for granted routines and tradition. You propose something new and that requires explanation and the explanation is coming through with architectural theory. At the same time with the possibility using drawings and as well as perspective for the first time to design and represent and simulate visually through a set of drawings and perspectives uh, the proposal. So that's the ingredients of architecture as a discipline in contrast to just building, which is a full set of drawings developing a design based on original ideas with an author architect and backed up by theoretical explanations. Mm -hmm. And since then, there's been a tradition of books on architecture, theories of architecture, usually combining text and image, where also architects develop the drawings and published drawings of potentially not yet built or unbuilt project. The ideas are circulating in a discourse and discipline. And so my theoretical work is in this tradition. And of course, you have to update explanations and notions as architecture adapts and its resources, ideas to an evolving societal context. And that has also been a theme within architectural theory with major historical shifts, the idea of architecture responding to that with a new style. So the concept of style came relatively late as a conscious concept to be reflected. That started in the 19th century, but all prior innovations in this 500-year history has, were tied to various styles adapting to different socioeconomic eras. And that's also my self-reflection on that in the contemporary era, which is a new socioeconomic era in my view, uh, which I call post first network society, requires a new style, which I call parametricism, where all elements of the built environment and of architectural designs are parametrically variable in adaptation to contextual conditions as well as to complex agglomeration of elements and spaces and buildings which start to adapt to each other ideally and to develop a a kind of organic new texture of the city. For anybody who hasn't seen the work of Zahadid and Zahadid Architects, um, your work with her, can you just describe where that theory of parametricism has led you in terms of the actual built architecture? What does it look like? What is that style? Well, first I want to mention that um, theoretical reflection is not always ahead of the game. Sometimes it becomes in retrospectively, and this is the case here as well. So we developed a new repertoire more intuitively, which has to do with uh, re-inhabiting the historic city and having sites which are odd-shaped and complex contexts in which we embed new designs, which are not neat platonic forms, but more complex forms which adapt and embed themselves into contexts. And new uh, ways of doing this coming out of computational design techniques, 
we started this in the uh, maybe late 80s, early 90s, and then the reflection that this might stabilize into a new style, not only from one firm or one group of actors, but a whole generation of young architects and maturing architects. Then I, in reflection, after this had been going on for over 10 years, 15 years and more, I came out with the notion that this must mean something, the, the, uh, the kind of whole con generation of architects converging onto a new set of sensibilities, repertoires, interests and ways of designing that this deserves to be called a new style. And at that point I came out with the phrase, I thought it deserved a name, and I called it parametricism, which is, which is based on uh, design tools which, which keep many parameters and form shape parameters at play and malleable in the process of a kind of adaptive coordination of spaces and buildings to each other. So that's the way it emerged. And it looks very organic. It looks fluid. It looks more complex. These are not separate platonic forms, but more multi-faced and complex forms. But the idea here is that the complexity of many spaces is resolved in some kind of a legible and organic way using curvature to make it more legible. Yeah, I would describe it like that. Right. So your theory and the style... As you've just said, part of it is essentially rejecting some of the, I guess, modernist principles of rigid formal geometries like squares and circles, yeah. um, as well as concepts like repetition, yeah. which were part of the basis for modernism. As you're hoping to move to this new, obviously your office is, but not everybody else is, to this new style of, of parametricism. Do you see those kind of, I think you call them heuristics, these kind of guidelines you're establishing for a more fluid, curvilinear yeah. uh, geometry. Is there a moral, uh, maybe moral isn't the right word, but a normative implication of architectural theory where when you reach a certain point, let's say in society, that there's a right and a wrong way to design buildings, to develop the built environment? Um, yes, maybe not right or wrong so much as a more advantageous and less advantageous. Okay. Uh, you could be quite pragmatic about this. So... I'm talking about new opportunities and challenges of this stage of societal development in the advanced arenas, in the main metropolitan arenas, where this is maybe most urgent. But then I think it also could generalize. Modernism has anyway went into crisis and has been rejected in starting in the 70s and 80s. Architects and audiences, the general public, pulled away from these uh, the era of spreading city out into the suburbs with very um, mass-reproduced sterile blocks with the idea of zoning the city into distinct zones which were separate. These ideas of modernism which were potent and powerful for maybe 60, 70 years and were congenial to what I call the Fordist paradigm of assembly line style mass reproduction where every family had that kind of industrial created house, car, a washing machine, cornflakes on the table, and uh, one or two TV channels in that kind of mass market and mass repetition mode. That period was great, but it also, the next stage of prosperity wasn't, the next stage was fueled by the microelectronic revolution and the ability to have much more shorter cycles of innovation mass customization, reprogramming of machinery rather than fixed mold assembly lines. And that changed the whole um, dynamic of live and work. That wasn't so separate anymore. And the move back to cities with the focus on research, development, marketing, of stitching up new relationships between clusters of firms which reconfigure for projects. And that is a whole new dynamic which destroyed, in a sense, the, the meaningfulness of a modernist centrally planned and most oftentimes also centrally delivered development model into a model which is much more market-driven, much more decentralized decision-making and more complex agglomerations. And so modernism disappeared. Uh, in terms of the reaction from, with architecture was uh, because it was moving back to historic cities and criticism of uh, the modernist repetition, there was postmodernism, which was a mixture of looking at old motifs, but also a kind of pop culture, 
of making architecture more diverse. And this expressed a diversification of lifestyles and the stratification of lifestyles to some extent. That was a short-lived, relatively short-lived uh, style, which broke the neck of modernism and out of this developed deconstructivism, which was continuing with this idea of contingent juxtaposition, interpenetration of, of figures and forms, meaning institutions coming together in new hybrids, mixed-use complexes in sites which were non-heterogeneous already, and that required a new revolution in aesthetic sensibilities once more, and deconstructivism was where Zahadid started. And out of that, with the same problematic of organizing these new symbiotic clusters in, in, in the inner city, develop pragmatism as a style that maybe can do all the things which deconstructivism and postmodernism started to do, but doing it in ways which maintain more legibility and a sense of order. Because if you look at what happened, because pragmatism hasn't succeeded, and also deconstructivism as a style didn't quite succeed, but the sensibility of deconstructivism succeeded inadvertently through this sense of nearly a random agglomeration of urban fragments and buildings and kind of involuntary deconstructivist urbanism, which I call garbage spill urbanization. That's what we're facing. So we're facing a sense of an identity-less spill where urban identities can't be built up because everything is so randomly agglomerated. It's different in each part of the city and different in different places around the world, but it appears all the same, like all our garbage heaps look the same around the world. Because the ingredients might be different, but they cancel each other out and they don't build up an ordered identity. So, so that's one of the, the ideas of, of parametrism and parametric urbanism that we, with that new style, and that's my thesis, should be able to build up new regional and path-dependent cumulative urban identities which are nature-like in a sense, uh, like a multi-species ecology. So this is all premised on a much more market-driven process, and I'm talking about market-based urban order, and I believe that we can develop a sense of urban order without relying on a central plan, on a blueprint, on a design city. It can be evolving bottom-up through um, entrepreneurial interventions, calling on architects, to develop a multi-species ecology like the jungle or, or natural environments, there's nobody who has designed those. They come out, out of bottom-up processes of overlaying different species, different systems, different interventions, but with a, the with a sensibility of and the necessity of interarticulating and fitting in. And that's my, my vision and as a strong underlying uh, socio-economic premise here, which is post forest network society based on the new production systems of robotics and the microelectronic evolution. And then on the political side, this has led, and I would like it to further lead to a, a much more free forms of entrepreneurship and much more free reign for markets to function. And yet, I'm arguing that an architectural development process and urban design process could flourish not only with much more programmatic intricacy of garnering synergies and letting this complex web of cooperation uh, flourish, but that uh, this could also be given form and legibility through an architectural design methodology, which we are working on and could deliver that if it was generalized across the discipline, which at the moment it isn't. Based on that, I want to come back to some of the details about yep. your thoughts about urbanism and urban design. Yep. But based on what you just said, Let's switch gears a bit from talking about architectural theory, which you've done quite a bit of work in, to political economic theory, which is what has, I guess, has brought us together here. That's sure. really the focus of our podcast is specifically looking at libertarian or non-governmental solutions for the development of the built environment. Yeah. And the way we found you is there was a presentation you gave where I realized that you were saying a lot of the same kind of things that we were saying. And after reading some of your writings, I realized that we're, I think we're on the same wavelength in a lot of ways. Can you talk a bit about your political econo or political theory, political economic theory, whatever you want to call it, talking about how you've come to these ideas? You've written that at one point earlier on, you were more of a Marxist and you've moved from there to more of this, uh, I think, a libertarian uh, position. Can you talk about that Well, transition? that's right. I've been, I have a lifelong curiosity about um, how society operates, functions, and an interest in contributing to societal progress. And uh, I was early on captured by Marx's vision and ambition to understand 
societal processes on the basis of economic underlying processes, and I think that's very important. This idea of historical materialism, that history, the various forms uh, societies take have a lot to do with the way they can reproduce their material life, and I still believe that. And that led me to being keen in trying to understand economic principles, economic systems, the pros and cons, and how they evolve through history. So I was initially attracted to Marx because of this uh, more profound and fundamental sense of political economy, which just looks at the deep sociological relations which underpin this, looks deep at the technologies which allow certain social formations to emerge, and reflects that all the way through into a legal system and a political system. And I think that ambitious, comprehensive theory I was attracted to. Also, as a young man, my sensibilities in terms of working in a company and that idea that some kind of ownership relationships and class relationships one would encounter might be barriers to full participation and communication within the uh, production process. And I still feel that there is an element of truth in this. But the critique of capitalism made some sense to me. But what was uh, lacking, of course, was, was the formulation of an alternative which would be viable. <laughs> so there was a bit of maybe the Nirvana fallacy <laughs> at, at play when you can reject certain structures and, and forms of interaction. But what would substitute for this was less reflected and it became, uh, in fact, a, a real Achilles heel for the Marxist socialist movement. And also, I mean, as the um, Eastern Bloc socialism started to crumble and collapse and reveal its problems, I mean, they were understood before already, but it became more pronounced. I think also uh, many of us shifted away from socialist ideals and became critical. There was a debate on actually so-called market socialism at the time. In the late 80s, I was participating in, and early 90s. And uh, they became more mainstream, I thought I was, became more resigned to some kind of social democracy market, social uh, liberal market, a regulated market under the heading of a representative democracy. That was through most of the 90s into the two th- up to 2008. And 2008 was the big crash and also for me the big shock and challenge to comprehend that the severity of that dislocation. And at that time, there was a flurry of attempts to explain this. And at that time, I discovered I didn't find credible anymore the explanations from the left who wanted to go back to formulas, to Keynesian formulas of the 70s, on attributing this to deregulation and, and capitalism. I was looking at the same time at a new set of explanations coming out of Austin economics. Vincent Tom Woods' meltdown, I started to read. And then from there, it was looking at Peter Schiff, looking at the Mises Institute, looking at Mises himself, Hayek, Rothbard, and realized that out of this milieu, there was a much more compelling set of explanations coming through. And also their ability to point back to predictions and warnings, show how prescient they were with, with about the possibility of such meltdowns. So that convinced me, I was convinced through um, that intellectual encounter that solutions might be thought elsewhere. And in the last eight years since then, it has only been confirmed the way these policies of trying to move out of the crisis through policies which brought us into the crisis imply a kind of stagnation in Europe ever since, which I find tragic. And if you look at Spain and Portugal and Italy and Greece with youth unemployment of 50-60%. It's a tragedy, whole generation wasted and lost because an attempt is made to hold on to unsustainable socioeconomic policies and systems. And I wish we could find somewhere in the Western advanced world an opportunity to break through this and have another Thatcher moment, perhaps, much required, but more radical, perhaps. And I think there is a stimulating discourse within the libertarian movement and Austin economics, but also wider in the economics profession. I'm interested in new institutional economics and um, political theory, and I'm fascinated by the idea that more uh, entrepreneurial freedom would be beneficial because in my own experience I face uh, in the city here, but also in trying to run a business and develop a business, that we are far too constrained and that the uh, rationality of market mechanisms is blunted and aborted and blocked on so many levels, which led to the financial meltdown to begin with, but also now prevents us from finding new dynamism out of this this stagnation, which I find very, very problematic. So there's my a little my short my, the history of my political development.
And I found, I challenged myself how this might be coherent with my idea of hermeticism, which I had developed before, and the idea of hermetic urbanism, which calls for a much more ordered built environment initially. So it seemed as if it would require more of a strong hand and a more stricter planning uh, hand at play, because what we were rejecting was this random garbage spill intuitively, and we wanted a complex, variegated order eligibility and initially it is rule-based but then thinking it through I realized that this kind of rule-based way of working doesn't need a unified hand it just needs some kind of ethos and conversions within a discipline with very very different and ever varied ways of continuing an urban texture it would also be in the interest of every investor about articulating why this particular site needs to make connections and is located here and signal that embeds itself in the particular locale for good reasons. So I felt in the end that the style of permatism could actually thrive more and be very congenial to a radicalized libertarian form of urban development and societal process. One word you mentioned there was that parametricism is rule-based and yet you describe it as essentially a, I don't know if libertarians are right word, but it's a an independent development process where you can have multiple authors or multiple separate yeah. designers, architects working within the context of a city. But the thought is that they're working off of a basic rule set, but coming up with very different solutions. And I think there's a strong parallel there to the political theory of libertarianism, where we promote this fundamental principle we call the non-aggression principle, yeah. and then trying to determine how that works itself out into in the rest of society. And it's a similar thing. People often look at the types of ideas we're proposing, especially when we start talking about things like anarcho-capitalism, and they say, oh, you just don't want to have rules. You, know, <laughs> you want a, a lawless you know, disorder uh, in the city. And of course, that's not it. Are we believing in bottom-up convergences towards standards? You have that in industry all the time. You have There could be a f also uh, organizational aspects to this. I mean, but there, we don't need a one-fit-all, top-down imposed set of rules because they will be inflexible. There will be probably false. The decisions process which lead to imposing them are suspect to me. And when you have political process which is fueled by demagogy and special interests. So I rather have something where decisions emerge in a competition between different standards and rules and best practices, and they would converge. Something like in the sciences, for instance, where certain paradigms become dominant because they're just compelling and convincing, and they would then give structure and compatibility to the various research programs underneath. And my concept of style is modeled and conceived in parallel to the concept of paradigm in the sciences. This is just this is on a very abstract level. The various endeavors and, and projects will be compatible with each other. The additional nuance here is that there are certain abstract imperatives, for instance, contextual embedding, affiliation, multiple affiliation, looking for continuities within the context with which the project could participate. But there's many ways in which one can continue a certain axis or strategy or certain, uh, let's say, massing, swelling, uh, swelling around the center. Um, the, 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 so these are abstract and always many ways one could fit in and make participate in the building of an overall texture, which also allows buildings to maintain their own identity within this. So buildings could be different in some respects, but similar and serving an urban idea at the same time. And how would that be um, enforced, inverted commas? It wouldn't be enforced strictly, but this is something where a discourse, like in the sciences, where colleagues critique each other and laudate and, and condone each other's work and celebrate each other's work or, or disrespect each other's works. That's the way these convergences emerge. Also that the rati underlying rationality of these principles will show up in the success of these projects with clients, uh, with audiences. So uh, that is good enough in the market process on the one hand, but also in a discursive process, which isn't an, a money-based competitive process, but it's a reputation-based intellectual competitive process. Through these processes, I think there's enough force and seduction, if you like, to allow a certain set of principles to be maintained and be shared. And uh, I think that's what I see in that 
that would be far superior way of giving order and uh, let's say continuity to a city which in the end is one single machine which operates in unison to some extent uh, and uh, with degrees of autonomy in the different parts rather than some kind of bureaucratic imposition which is far too crude uh, doesn't allow for the information processing which which needs to feed into this and uh, was also will be always out of date so for me it's very important that an entrepreneur has freedom to pick out certain parcels bit for them with an idea of how dense one should be building on here what the program mix should be how each of the programs will be articulated into into units and products and which architect to hire and the architect would then in a kind of well understood division of labor between an entrepreneurial developer and an architect the, the, the mature sophisticated developer would give the architect a lot of scope in translating this into spatial solutions and giving that an, a morphological and characterization and a formal atmospheric characterization that should be left to the architect if he understands the life process intention of the developer what he, what his vision is of hosting audiences so there i see that the market process and development process with various investors and developers bidding for their particular program mixes so you have a, it's all about synergy garnering when you bring a particular club into proximity with the university with a certain business district with a certain set of local facilities one could rely on or would have to be synergistically tie in with that can only an entrepreneur can can do that and if he gets it wrong he will quickly be substituted by another one who then can try a, a different program mix so the kind of discovery process of the market of discovering synergies and a viable programmatic textures in this fashion that will be coming to the market and the architect would give a kind of formal articulation spatial articulation to the programmatic rationality in terms of making it legible easy to navigate uh, easy to communicate what's on offer so what's on offer is put in by the developer how that communicates itself and ties itself into a texture of other communications that would be the the architect's job and i see there no role really for a um, central plan to be anything but a hindrance now that to the extent that there are sometimes collective action issues perhaps i would rather rely on land owner associations or the potential in certain zones to have consolidated parcels where a developer takes up larger chunks that's one way but also i think there's a role for small interventions to stay small and divided and with this quicker turnover of these various tenants and interventions one could also evolve a texture which is high performance which then could give an image to a developer oftentimes the developer gets his idea for a larger complex from a kind of bottom up grown complex but then uh, it can be kind of imitated or varied by a developer so yeah i think i trust a lot in markets anyway that's a working hypothesis is yet to be tested and tried and i'm proselytizing i'm hoping for that uh, developers are given more freedom and, and the architects are given more freedom because currently in london for instance there is far too much imposition its exact density requirements the overall quantum is defined the, the program categories are predefined within the program categories it's a various breakdowns into for instance residential unit types down the way to each room size is prescribed planners also come back and want to prescribe and have opinions about the way this communicates itself in terms of a facade in terms of an expression so they also want to in a sense speak on behalf of and that takes away the architect's core competency of making the built environment speak and communicate its essential ingredients to users so that is blunted so that's why i'm critical about it. i mean central planning was viable and you had a very very simple roll out of the five things i was talking about in terms of a very simple pattern of living with a unified consumption standard where everybody has this house car washing machine tv set and then a kind of factory job and then a recreational football pitch or something and you roll that out in the, in a suburban landscape that can be planned perhaps but not the contemporary highly pulsating fluctuating intricate synergies which accumulate in dense urban centers that can no longer be managed by a central authority central authority has in fact 
pulled away from a lot of its direct investments, of course, but it still maintains the illusion, I think, of being able to guide, which often means far less development happens because only those developments happen where the planners in position still maintain some possibilities as viable possibilities, but they are certainly a severe underutilization of all land uses in the current system because also these color-coded program distributions, they're decades old and they are insisted upon, they're so-called milieu protection, they're rigidified and central government had to come in to unblock some of this with the prerogative of development rights of converting office space into residential because the imbalances of demand were had kind of built up to such huge amounts that it became uh, obvious, not obvious enough for the borrowers. It had to be central government who steps in. And it's interesting that sometimes central government has more of a sense to understand an overall societal rationality rather than the kind of divided borrowers, curiously. Mm-hmm. But that's something one needs to reflect on. The housing minister also came in and said, abolish all these housing standards, which don't allow the market as discovery process of what kind of sizes and units and products might be required. So I'm temporarily aligning with central government because they're trying to break up a political and over-politicized development process. Later on, I think that that's only an interim step. (laughs) (laughs) Let's talk a bit about, I see a similarity between your efforts to promote parametricism, which is, I think by your own admission, kind of an avant-garde, in some ways radical architectural theory, as well as our shared, I think, goal of promoting this radical idea of libertarianism. Are there similar challenges in the way that you promote those ideas? What's the best way to spread those ideas and to start to convince people for example, that they should design according to these parametric heuristics or that they should govern according well, to these Well, it's interesting. I mean, the, um, the parametrism was actually throughout most of the 90s and into the early 2000s doing very well in terms of converting a large part of a whole new generation of architects who brought into schools and got intuitively attracted to the new design freedoms because there's more degrees of freedom unusual forms to play with, so you have more design repertoire, more more facility to address a design problem, as well as new powerful tools to build up this complexity, and this idea of rule-based design and parametric systems and uh, scripting rather than drawing every line. You have algorithms. This has been fascinating many, and a lot of people got attracted to that. This got a little bit defrayed and diverted when the, the crisis hit. The financial so that, crisis. Yeah. So that brought a stop to this also because a lot of the younger firms who had been getting more work, all of Europe had, was, had projects. We had projects in every city of Spain and multiple cities in Italy, Germany, France, Belgium. So as that stopped, that forward-looking spirit of concentrating on design and creating... Uh, visionary projects, you need some kind of background of optimism and uh, development flourish. So that was interrupted and and then you had the Occupy movement, you had the European debt crisis, you had Arab Spring, a lot of political discourse and distraction, mostly unfortunately in an anti-capitalist fashion and sensibility. So that was breaking a little bit the parametricism trajectory. Since then I had to work much harder to explain how this style fits in with our socioeconomic potentials. Talking about post photos network societies wasn't just an intuitive enthusiasm. People became skeptical and had to be convinced. For me, that meant to bring out more of the, the explanations out of a socioeconomic historical perspective. And uh, I published a lot of articles, I published books, and I realized that that gets some resonance, but insufficient. So I have to do more in one-to-ones because a lot of particular when it comes to the political sensibilities in our discipline, they're very much left-leaning and anti-capitalist. And the radicalization in the left direction has also been pervasive in our discipline. So it is a bit lonely. It's a bit kind of uh, difficult. It's a tough one. One has to really sit down in small groups, in one-to-ones, I used Facebook a lot. You get a lot of bad backlash. (laughs) And then you come back with individual statements. And so it's a very, very difficult process. 
in the political arena more difficult than in the pragmatism arena, but also there I got a lot of backlash because pragmatism was then associated with neoliberalism because it was part of that boom. And we had work also in places like Dubai, and um, there was this kind of a sense of uh, being associated with something unsustainable and extravagant. So that had to be battled, and I believe that pragmatism is not about extravagance, it's about articulating a, a complexity which comes out of our relationship becoming more integral, and we need to become closer together, be intervisible to each other, interwear to each other, and that can't happen in extruded boxes and in sterile minimalist towers where, where floors are cut off from each other and where buildings are, and zones are separated. So to try the rationality, the socioeconomic and life-enhancing rationality of permetricism. And similarly, I'm trying to argue, obviously, for the libertarian movement and ideas as something which has socioeconomic rationality, which has prosperity and freedom potentials. And I'm very fascinated by the end point of a totally stateless condition also where um, multiple legal systems are in competition with the jurisdictions and courts are free enterprises in the market. All this is fascinating. The same is with the privatization of all space, streets, places, all public spaces as private ventures with various forms of monetizing and investing back into these. These are fascinating radical proposals and that's an end point one could look towards when, or it's a hypothesis, but for me it's important that what are the steps, what's the direction of travel? Do I risk a bit more entrepreneurial freedom, a bit more self-responsibility on the part of individuals, employees, or am I relying more on the state to regulate further and prevent risks and guarantee deposits and, and pensions and X, Y, and Z, which I think is the root to stagnation. So so while I'm intellectually fascinated by the, the more radical proposals, what's more important, I think, in the interim is the direction of travel with anarcho-capitalism on the horizon, but not something which I expect to be coming around rapidly. But I think it's important that one can think these things through, and in the meantime, I have to make choices with respect to more or less government involvement. Uh, more or less resources funneled through uh, state apparatus at the moment in Europe. It's nearly in every country above 50% of GDP, which is, I think, highly problematic. But a lot of people are so used to it, they can't think of anything else. And there's this habit whenever there's a problem to call on the state to fix it. And I'm trying to break these kind of pet habits of thought. And it's tough, as I said. It's, it mostly requires tenacious one by one uh, across for weeks <laughs> and you build a kind of certain sympathy or you overcome the the prejudice against and you you can maybe dent and crack a little bit the kind of anti-capitalist sensibility in some people but these things need to be also digested and just stayed, I guess in people but what I find very fascinating is that there's a young generation of at universities as European Students for Liberty and other uh, a young generation for the first time politically sensitized not towards the left but towards the libertarian project i find that most encouraging you've made me think of earlier you mentioned uh, the phrase tradition bound yeah. building and made me think of the term as you're describing the way people think about the status quo of the socioeconomic conditions as kind of tradition bound thinking right? <laughs> this is the way that people it's not so much that they have a competing theory that they think is superior it's that they might not have any it it's that's, something, I, I mean, in particular, or... if you look at the, let's say, left liberal consensus with an anti-capitalist kind of tinge and suspicion against business and corporations and business processes, that's very, very deeply ingrained. And this has been, I guess, around in the... This was fermented already in the late 19th century into the early 20th century. I think in the 1920s, the intellectual elites of the world mostly were brought over and expecting socialism to be the solution. This went on through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 60s again with the 68 and so on, a big surge in Marxism and, and socialism, that whole generation. So that's a long, long, decade-long left tilt of intellectuals. Only the economists, I mean, that's at the edge where you think things through. Of course, the economic profession is also pro-status in many ways because of career opportunities in governments and central banks and large firms who are 
invested in the status quo. But still, the economics profession is, of course, the cutting edge of thinking about economic and social economic relations. That's where the ideas we have are much more welcome, much more viable. So they are this, the frontier. But the rest of the intellectual milieus, average scientists and average social science in particular, historian, uh, but also architects, anybody who is an academic, will be left-oriented. That's because there's this inertia what you brought up with, what everybody around you believes. And to stir against that is very hard. It's just, it's, it's not, a, it's just taken for granted. Mm-hmm. These things have been repeated a thousand of times. How one values and which, how one would value certain parties and politicians and the, the kind of sympathy for the Labour Party would be near universal in, in academic milieus, for instance. So that's what one is breaking, one has to break with. And it's tough because it's not always understood. One is seen as an outcast and the political vocabulary is very, very poor. So if one starts to move against this various forms of left politics, one is considered to be right and right-wing and suddenly one, one is a fascist. And one is stigmatized and defamed quite quickly because one is breaking that consensus, which is very comfortable or taken for granted, and people find it outrageous. And one is also then oftentimes, coincidentally, what one says overlaps with some of the things said on the right. With something like the Tea Party, there's overlapping with things a Steve Bannon might say, but without being that political direction at all, there's this kind of heightened, tense polarization and a very, very poor left-right political compass. One finds oneself very quickly defamed and castigated and one breaks a kind of sense of good taste (laughs) when it becomes uh, problematic. And that's something one needs to navigate and one has to have a certain robust and thick skin but also not lose confidence in one's opinions of not withdrawing anything of what I've been saying. Uh, but one needs to be aware of how one says it, how one mediates it, and how one explains that what we're talking about is precisely aiming for the same fundamental hopes and ideals of a free and prosperous, emancipated and, and pleasant human condition. And also one which universalizes, which is meant to be and will be, in my view, free and, and prosperous for everybody. Even when it comes to income inequalities and such uh, phenomena, which I do find problematic, I believe that the society we're talking about in terms of libertarian society, we will have less of. We will have some, of course, particularly in globalization, when good ideas can become gifts for millions and millions of people around the world. That's some fraction of that consumer surplus and that prosperity flows back to the origin, but oftentimes not to be consumed, but to kind of reinvest it We shouldn't kind of be worried about this too much, but the current system has, of course, entrenched inequalities which are based on using the state apparatus in a kind of crony capitalist scenario to protect special interests, to enhance special interests. The inflated wealth of the whole financial sector, I think, is something you wouldn't find in a truly free market condition. And the bottom end, you also wouldn't find those kind of underclass ghettos. One would have to theorize uh, what what fuels us and maintains those and I think that the, the welfare state and the way it's been administered has a lot to answer for where a remedy becomes a poison chalice etc so these are topics which I'm touching on which are of course incredibly charged and sensitive and I'm offering some reflections in goodwill and in, in the spirit of let's communicate about these things and they're not meant to denigrate anybody not meant to be it ad hominem in any sense, we are all individuals and if we start criticizing certain categories and certain, for instance, I was talking about planners or talking about other categories, we are not defined by those and everybody will flourish differently in, in a different societal condition. Talking about the way you try to convince people of these ideas, you talked about kind of one-on-one conversations, trying to have a longer meditative discussion. Is there value in the, I guess, the shock value of putting something, a radical idea out there? And I'm thinking not just politically, but certainly many of Zahadid Architects' projects, the projects themselves are perceived as, again, avant-garde, radical, shocking probably to some people. Is there value in that shock value in spreading the ideas? Uh, I don't know. I mean, this is not something we seek. Maybe we get uh, you working within a certain idiom or... 
you get maybe don't even perceive that anymore that strangeness which appears to others and my view is I'm not aiming for this and if I have my young architects here playing and they go overboard and I pull back actually and, and rein in more than anything so I'm not out there to shock I want these things to be sensible and there is an element where something fresh and stimulating appearance is a side effect which is positive sometimes for an institution which wants to express its corporate culture and the new sensibilities which we perceive. We would love to work for Google, for instance, and we have other companies we're working for. If they show in the physiognomy of their built environment, which is designed for their processes, that this shows up as looking different, because it is different, then all the better for it. And it could also be stimulating. I believe that built environments should be arenas where people in self-directed ways self-organize and appropriate spaces which might have a degree of indeterminacy and openness so they should communicate roughly the kind of activities they might host but we wouldn't be overly prescriptive about this so decoding and making strange is sometimes a good strategy to allow for discovery of new ideas when you don't fall into routine right away so that's part of it it's not meant to shock it's meant to maybe withdraw the routine condition to allow you to reflect on how would I actually want to reinvent my setting if I'm not allowed to fall back to unthought of routine. So there's an element of that. That would be also in terms of urban spaces. But it's not, I'm not interested and in out to shock. It's a similar maybe with my libertarian thesis. I'm so used to them and I'm speaking with like-minded people or I had this debate before without being initially, immediately kind of uh, outcast. So I was a bit naive when I proposed certain notions that I would get this kind of uh, harsh backlash. I was not consciously calling out to provoke to get notoriety. I mean, that's not, I think, a great strategy in principle. I mean, take this with a pinch of salt. Maybe sometimes one can throw in a proposition, but like the Hyde Park proposition, maybe that was the only bit of provocation I said, you know, imagine building a, a, a city over Hyde Park. But I still think it's not totally out of the question. Not the whole of Hyde Park. I said, you know, leave 20% or you still have Green Park and St. James's Park and just picture what you could do. And I think um, that that's still not absolutely out of the, out of the way uh, proposal, I think. There's always a trade-off city has to play. And if you want to keep a lot of historical preservation and keep a density and an image of a city as one has learned to like it, then that's not necessarily compatible with being the most vibrant and dynamic and prosperous metropolis. You have now in the city of London, you have actually a piece of urban texture which is incredibly dynamic and they're piling it in there. And they have found a political frame by excluding residential actually, and therefore excluding protest and resistance and blockage quite deliberately. And they are able to, and consciously, be able to maintain a piece of infrastructure and build city which is incredibly dynamic and could remake itself continuously. And that looks nothing like it looked 20 years ago. So, uh, okay, we have it here. We don't have to have it everywhere. We maybe don't need it in Hyde Park. Right. <laughs> but if the city of London was also, for instance, preserved as it was, if the West End was preserved as it was and all the pieces, then you would have to say, hey, maybe it's not the London uh, wouldn't be what it is. So I say it's just a trade-off and a worthwhile uh, speculation. It was provocative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the ways that cities develop, we've talked in our podcast a bit about um, the challenges of urban planning, centralized urban planning, specifically thinking about the ideas of, of Mises and Hayek, who talk about tacit knowledge and self-organization, where it's not possible for any one central planner, even group of central planners, to discern what is needed or desired by all of the various individuals and organizations that make up the society and that use space in the city. What do you see as the role of urban planning and what are the limits of it? Some form of planning is perhaps required for certain shared infrastructures. There are certain rules which most people have to subscribe to if you want to have a continuous street network which traverses various privately held development sites. That maybe doesn't need a central hand, maybe that needs certain individual negotiations. One could then ask for 
transaction costs, whether a certain collective action would be more efficient. I mean, there are examples of private cities like Gogo in India, where you have a kind of agglomeration of private parcels, and they manage to have a traffic system running through and private bus lines. They didn't manage to have an infrastructure grid, sewage and electric grid, etc. They didn't manage to pull this together. So there's issues there where it's inefficient in terms of the potentials of what would come through collective action potential. But So they didn't get it together. It doesn't mean that they can't get it together. As I understood it, the sewage there and I think the power were originally supposed to be provided by the local government or some aspect the whole, of the The whole government. city is happening because the local government was so weak in this province. There was a kind of vacuum. And... I think this is not the end of the day, and power supply there is relatively stable compared to municipally organized cities. But there is, compared to a well-managed Western city, maybe there's deficiencies. But there's also a kind of great dynamic going on. And anyway, it's India, it's not Western Europe or US, so we, we have to also be careful comparing like to like. But I know that there should be and must be and might be certain collective projects which owners would have to kind of collaborate on. And I, I would trust this to owner, landowner associations. Of course, there's a vulnerability to holdouts, to free riding. So there's a lot of the issues which one could argue uh, the state is able to solve some of those or some forms of state. So I'm pragmatic and open-minded about which mechanism would be developed and how they would be enforced, inverted commas. So I'm optimistic. What I find problematic is currently, I think it's better to involve those in the decision-making process who have direct knowledge, engagement and stakes in these issues. So rather than having a municipal government elected by the totality of the population, regulating everything based on a mandate which comes around every four years and with citizens which don't concern themselves with these details ever because they don't concern themselves enough. Rather than that, I would look at some form of politics to be more issue-based rather than one kind of assembly for everything. And each issue might develop its own kind of forms of collective action, like in land on association, regulating rules or legal system, establishing forms of property right, which might, in an urban texture, require some kind of easement, right of passage, potentially, certainly for fire trucks and such. I don't necessarily believe that that needs to become from a state with a monopoly of violence, but these issues are interesting questions and they are forms of, you could call them private planning, a uh, form of collective planning of various associations and organizations, which will have their own way of soft enforcement maybe, because as collective landowner associations, they could also freeze out like rogue holdouts or would-be free riders. I'm trusting in the ingenuity of collective mechanisms also, and the mechanism of association, which in the history is full of those, and this idea of a central authority, state authority within a certain territory with universal competency across all collective binding decisions is only one solution which is relatively new and a relatively small part of the world actually functioning. That model is, in a sense, faked and mocked up and copied in name with all the phrases in a lot of other countries which function very, very differently. So they are, every country has parliaments and, <laughs> and courts and parliamentarians and ministers, and, but they function very, very differently from the model which we have maybe here. So I think that's, uh, there's another aspect one we should look at. So central planning, no forms of emergent collective action processes, yes. So what are some forms that, again, thinking about the style or the theory of parametricism, what are some forms that that can take? How do you express that in the built environment? Or what are the tools that you use to inject that into urban planning and the development of larger city areas? Well, I mean, the way I see it is this could really be a patchwork, which is never complete, it continuously grows. And it would also be different layers. Somebody can propose a monorail to run through a number of sites which are held differently. And that's an entrepreneurial proposal. When we look at the cost and benefits and if it's an economic opportunity, then those who are giving right of passage will tie in with and the parametricism would take, then an architect would be hired and he would then be able to let this flow through and articulate the stations, maybe each one different rather than one 
repeated all across, each one differently adapted to the local conditions. It doesn't even have to be by the, by the same architect. But since we're in a discourse where we watch each other as colleagues, admire each other and criticize each other, I think there's there would be the force which would make that an organic and coherent and yet varied and diverse entity. So you could have these different layers coming through. And I think the idea, I'm fascinated by that public spaces would be private ventures. I find that fascinating. So right now I find public space a little bit the one-fit-all bleakness. There's these kind of flower pots and, and various ways of paving and certain rhetoric attached to it that it's meant for all and then it's always a bleak kind of sameness. And in reality, I think we have multiple audiences, multiple publics in different parts of the city in different conditions, maybe looking for very, very different types of spaces and they emerge bottom up through entrepreneurial ventures. You know, if you look at different you know, Camden market is where it has pulls on a certain crowd from all over Europe, then there's various markets and places and subcultures and if you think about it this way you could have a much, much richer set of satisfying and efficiently used public spaces and that doesn't mean that you will have to pay a toll at every one of them, maybe some of them, but it's like the internet. You're using Google for free, using Facebook and Twitter and all of this. There are various ways of generating revenue, whether it's coming through the shops who are on that space who finance it, or whether it's advertising or a subscription. You know, there's many, many ways of making that economically viable in a very pleasant and inclusive way. And I think that's the way a much more richer and fertile and stimulating city might emerge. And you wouldn't want to like a situation where bars and pubs and clubs were all state provided according to a formula where every single one of them is safe for three-year-old kids because families have to be in. Or a certain stereotype, the common denominator has to be catered for across the whole city. And imagine that it's not an improvement on your city. It's actually killing your city. And, and I think we will look back on the current provision of public spaces as such a nightmare mm -hmm. <laughs> that you're seeing in retrospect, this killed the potentials we're now discovering with, in a free enterprise system. You mentioned optimism earlier in the discussion. Based on what you just said, are you optimistic about change for the future, about moving closer to, a, as you've called it, a market-based urban order? Well, I mean, to some extent, yes. I think there's a nudging forward. I mean, we have, although most of the intellectuals have been kind of crying and howling uh, all the way through the neoliberal revolution. But it happened, and it happens, and it continues <coughs> to happen. It's mixed. I mean, the state expands in some ways, and it also keeps privatizing and draws away and or learns from private enterprise. So it's a double-edged thing. The overall taking GDP-wise of state has not shrunk much. It's been increasing, and that's worrisome. But I think there is, of course, less statism now in the UK than it was in the 70s. And a lot of this we owe to Thatcher, which I used to hate and, <laughs> and sneer at in my leftist youth. <laughs> and now I respect tremendously and I find fascinating as somebody like Thatcher got the instincts and then got Hayek and got the courage to bust through a lot of uh, entrenched expectations. Stunning. So I love her. <laughs> She's done and uh, surprising myself saying this when I look back at who I was and what I felt. More of that, but I'm afraid that we might need some kind of deepening of a crisis. Maybe we have to go to a kind of Corbyn disaster which where we're really tunneling for somebody else to come out, maybe with, a, with an intellectual leadership, of course, based on a libertarian outlook. This is growing, and when they can point back at what they've been saying, at what stage in history and how they've been predicting that a Corbyn government would be an utter disaster and have solutions and proposals ready. I think then we are in a post-Corbyn, we will have a, a libertarian revolution or transformation. The other hope was Scotland going independent. And I think Scotland is, is now a backwater a bit. It's a relatively stagnant and stale and it's kind of partly subsidized by, by the more prosperous parts of the UK. And I think it's if they will go separate and would try their socialist dream. Not that I wish them that disaster, but it's unfortunately inevitable. They would dig themselves into a hole out of which they would then have to pull themselves, and Europe is in a position to pull them out, and thank God, because that would be a bad way of keeping them subsidized, subsidizing failure.
So if a place like Scotland would pull away, would disillusion everybody in that socialist dream, where they would tunnel or dig themselves a deep hole in five, ten years, but then from that on, maybe the hardline of Adam Smith, <laughs> you would have voice. These voices will suddenly will have to be heard because all the left voices will be muted and will be covered in shame. <laughs> Which voices will be heard will be our voices, inverted commas, and Adam Smith's voice and so on. So I see their chance. Unfortunately, I have to say this because I see that uh, the last eight years and what continues to happen, you can see that people that without a major shock, and 2008 shocked me into a new direction and many others. I've heard a lot of people which in our milieu and in our political scene have been transformed by the 2008 experience. Another one must come around and next time they can't, these recipes of bailouts will not work. I'm not that I'm hoping for, I, I see it coming and want to be prepared for it, but that's where I see when the, when the libertarian revolution will happen. It just needs one country, but it needs to be an advanced country. UK, Scotland, could be relatively small, which shows the way, the way Britain showed the way. When Thatcher pulled off that miracle of that kind of degenerate, decrepit, failing and ailing Britain into an engine of growth and prosperity, that inspired a lot of people around the world. Actually, this was also inspiring the Chinese transformation of a Deng Xiaoping and emboldening many others. This was also, I think, the collapse of the whole Soviet Union and the transformations there. Thatcher is the beacon, I mean, is the signal. And I think we need a signal like this because I believe it will surge and it will be a success story. That will be the breakthrough. And it will happen in my lifetime, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'll definitely have it in my lifetime. So. Great. Well, Patrick, thank you for sharing your time with us here today and for my pleasure. sharing your voice. Thanks a lot for the patience and allowing me to give very, very long answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. We hope to hear more from you in the future. Sure.